Um, so my name is Craig Bassman. I am uh, in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital. I'm actually interventional cardiology trained. So, you know, my focus is on transcatheter therapies. Um, and I've done an extra year after all my fellowships in structural heart, which is basically valvular disease um, and you know how we treat valvular disease as minimally invasive as possible there's been a shift towards you know sparing patients from open heart surgeries um, and trying to do more transcatheter therapies um, obviously short term it's much easier for the patient and the question is is um, you know longer term so we're, we're learning more about that and I think you know as you know anyone going into the field that's if you're contemplating especially cardiothoracic surgery, um, the future really is transcatheter therapy because, you know, by the time you guys are out, I think that we'll have minimally invasive devices for pretty much every valve. Um, and um, so, you know, cardiothoracic surgery isn't going away, um, but it's shifting towards less and less invasive. And, and that's my area. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the management of aortic stenosis, which is the most commonly treated valvular pathology um, in, you know, our approach to it these days. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the heart team is, which I think is a central concept of incorporating uh, not just uh, the patient's cardiothoracic surgeon, but um, the cardiologist and other multiple uh, specialties uh, other, uh, other subspecialties so that everybody can kind of come together and figure out what the best option for each patient is. Um, so background, uh, you know, this is, you know, on, on the left, we see, you know, just a picture of the heart and the, the main chamber, the left ventricle pumps out to the rest of the body. And we know that the aortic valve is a tri-leaflet valve um, in the majority of cases. And the, the aortic valve is responsible for opening and closing to allow blood flow out. Um, as we age, the valve becomes more and more calcified. And in a subset of people, it gets very calcified and becomes stenotic, meaning the orifice closes and we don't, it doesn't allow enough blood flow to come out. So here on the top, you see a, a picture of basically um, the uh, aortic valve and how it narrows over time in some patients. Um, so, you know, is this an issue, you know, having calcium on the valve? Not really, um, but as it becomes, as it gets close, uh, um, as, as the valve area drops to below one centimeter squared, then patients start developing symptoms. And what we know that once you develop symptoms of aortic stenosis, your mortality rate is very high. And as you can see here in the bottom, if you have any symptoms and the classic symptoms are dyspnea, shortness of breath, um, chest pains or syncope, once you get one of those sym symptoms, you, the mortality rates are incredibly high unless you treat it. With treatment, patients can live to a normal life expectancy. Historically, surgery has been the mainstay treatment for all valvular heart disease, and that's in all age groups. But when you look at you know, uh, uh, mortality rates in patients that are 80 above, patients that are 70 that have, uh, you know, multiple comorbidities such as kidney problems, um, uh, heart failure, um, other valvular pathologies, coronary artery disease, you know, all, all, all the, it, it changes a bit and your surgical risk goes up. So, you know, a healthy, healthy 70 year old and a healthy 80 year old have different risk scores for having a heart surgery. And, and what we incorporate is not just your risk of mortality, but also your risk of morbidity, meaning what's the long-term effects, what's the short-term effects. You know, um, having a, a successful surgery and surviving isn't the only picture, but, you know, a 30-day hospital stay, um, a prolonged intubation, uh, pneumonias, other surgeries afterwards. I mean, all these things can really complicate uh, the picture. Um, so we really have to kind of use these risk scores uh, to evaluate each patient. So when you talk about aortic stenosis, why this is so important is because the disease gets worse as you age. So as you can see here, if surgery is the only option, then historically we were missing so many patients that just weren't amenable to surgery because they were too old, they were too frail, they had too many comorbidities. Um, so uh, now that we have a, a life expectancy that's projected to triple in the United States of America, um, we had to really 
figure out, you know, what are we going to do best? And that's why this surge in transcatheter technology has evolved. Um, but the question is, is we know that we can do it. We know that we can be successful, but is it the right option for everybody? And, and, and that's really where the debate is and where the heart team comes into play. So when we talk about valvular heart disease, we talk about a multidisciplinary approach. And we're talking about a cardiothoracic surgeon, we're talking about a cardiologist, we're talking about an anesthesiologist, we're talking about neurology, psychiatry, the family, we're talking about nurses, we're talking about research coordinators. Everybody needs to get on board to help figure out what the best option for each patient is. Because each of these therapies, whether it's transcatheter, which has the advantage of getting people out of the hospital within a day or two, um, uh, it has the advantage of less strokes, um, uh, or surgery, which has the advantage of maybe possibly uh, um, the valve lasting longer, or when you need another valve in 10 years, um, perhaps the patient's a better candidate for transcatheter therapy then. Um, so, you know, we have to really discuss what the best option for each patient is. And obviously everybody wants to, everybody wants to have a, a transcatheter therapy and get out of the hospital within a day or two. But the question is, is it the right therapy for you? Um, so this heart team kind of emerged as a class one indication in our guidelines. And, and it wasn't for valvular heart disease when it, when it first came out. It was for coronary artery disease. So the, the main question at that point was, you know, what should we do? Should we do a, uh, put in a stent or do a bypass surgery? And there was arguments, and again, they were factoring in the same things that we're factoring, which is aid, which is comorbidities. Um, and, and, and then what happened is they, they, they slowly said, you know what, listen, we need to not one person should make this decision. We need to get together as a group and figure out how we should manage treating the coronary artery disease. Um, and, and that became the standard of care for coronary disease. But then slowly as we transcatheter therapies developed for valvular heart disease, we saw that it became the standard of care approach for also valvular heart disease. So, you know, at Lennox, where we work, we have a, a large team that incorporates surgeons, interventional cardiologists, structural heart interventionalists, echo and imaging specialists, nurses, research coordinators, and then of course the other the patients, other doctors, you know, be it their kidney doctors, their neurologists, if they've had brain issues, um, psychiatrists, what, what, whatever it may be, we incorporate everyone into that decision to help kind of figure out what the best therapy is. And sometimes it's even no therapy for, for patients, but at least we, we have all options on the table and at least we have multiple people giving their input. Um, and, you know, as our valvular heart, heart disease guidelines evolved, it started to, people started to realize how important the utility of this heart team was. So it became a class one indication and, and not just for the heart team discussion, but that if you have aortic stenosis or another valvular pathology, that you should be evaluated in a heart center of expertise, meaning a heart center that has the ability to do transcatheter therapy, such as what we can do, but then also the ability to do uh, surgery, such as our surgical uh, colleagues in, in, the, in the department can do. So we have to basically offer these patients both therapies and then you know, come together to decide what the best therapy is. And, you know, I think the, the, the most important part of this, the, the heart team, is that when you look at a patient, you can't just look at their age. Are they old? Are they young? But you have to look at these risk scores. And then you have to look at things that you don't see on the risk scores, such as their frailty. And we've all seen a 75-year-old that looks like a 90-year-old and a 75-year-old that looks like a 55-year-old. And, and we have to factor that in because obviously the one that looks like a 90-year-old, the frailer one is not going to do as well as the 75-year-old the that looks great, that's still running on the treadmill. Um, and also that, that patient um, that's 75 that has kidney disease is not going to do as well as the 75-year-old without kidney disease. So we have to kind of take all these factors into account and try to, you know, factor in the healthiness of the patient with which therapy they should get. And then it comes down for aortic stenosis pretty much to the main question, which is, do we do a TAVR or a SAVR? TAVR is transcatheter aortic valve replacement. SAVR is surgical aortic valve replacement. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what a TAVR entails and the downsides of doing it now. Um, so uh, what we've seen is if, you know, any of you guys have been following along with the, the medical side of things is that, you know, recently uh, in, the, in the New York Times, there was this article, tens of thousands of, of 
of heart patients may not need open heart surgery anymore. And the, the, the reason they were saying this was because of some recent data that we had. And, and I wanna go through that data, but I also wanna go through a little bit about what Pataver entails. And I'm gonna try to, you know, uh, go through this uh, quickly and, and then open it up for questions. Um, so, you know, the end of this uh, lecture, we can basically, uh, you can ask any, any questions you want and um, try to get, uh, uh, um, make, make sure that I answer all the questions you want about this and also about the pathway to become a cardiothoracic surgeon or interventional cardiologist. Um, so I, I thought we'd start with the case. Um, and this is just a random case that I picked out that we've done recently. Um, but it was an 83 year old female who came in, she was short of breath. And um, uh, when she comes in with shortness of breath, she was evaluated and found to have aerial stenosis by her primary cardiologist who sent her to us. Um, what we do, we look at her labs. We see that her kidney function is a little bit elevated, but nothing crazy. Her creatinine is 1.5, normal is less than one. Her hemoglobin and her platelet count are fine. Uh, we calculate her risk score for morbidity mortality, and it comes out as 8.3%, which is high risk for surgery. So there we have a high risk patient, but that's symptomatic and that's having symptoms with associated with aortic stenosis. And we know that because you have symptoms with aortic stenosis, your mortality rates are very high and that this patient will likely die within a couple of years if we don't give any therapy, um, maybe sooner, um, or maybe just feel like crap and die from some other reason, maybe getting rehospitalized and dying from an infection. Um, but we know that our options are always three things. We can do surgery, we can do TAVR, we can do nothing and treat them medically. Those are the options. Um, her other medical history, she had um, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So she had some lung disease and atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular rhythm, which she was on anticoagulation for. Again, kind of increasing her risk of, uh, of surgery. We look at the EKG here, um, and that tells us a lot because after TAVR, um, one of the main, and I wouldn't even say complication, but one of the things that's associated with the procedure is because where we put the valve is right by the conduction system. Because the valve goes right over the conduction system, we often see that patients need a pacemaker afterwards. Um, so we look at their EKG before to see if they have any baseline conduction deficits. And if they do have conduction deficits, then they're higher risk for pacemaker. Um, and, and that has to be discussed with the patient because, you know, oftentimes we see people coming in with aortic stenosis for TAVR and they leave with a TAVR valve and a pacemaker. And, you know, we need to make sure that patients understand that they might be leaving with two devices before they uh, get out of the hospital. Um, then we look at her echocardiogram, her echocardiogram and we see here that her aortic valve, the AVA, which is the aortic valve area, is less than a centimeter. So. The blood, all the blood that goes out into your body is flowing through a valve that's less than a centimeter squared in area. Um, we use gradients also to, to quantify the severity. So normally your left ventricle pressure and your aortic pressure with no, uh, with a normal valve should be less than 10. It should be technically zero. There should be no difference between your left ventricular pressure when it pumps and your aortic pressure. Um, but when you have a small valve, then the pressure in the left ventricle has to get higher to pump out blood. So we see that the pressure in the left ventricle has increased and that the gradient between the aorta, which is the main blood vessel in the heart that pumps to the rest of the body and the left ventricle, which is the main chamber in the heart, we see that there's a gradient of over 48 millimeters of mercury, which, mean, which is severe. Uh, we, classify greater than 40 as severe, but oftentimes even less people are symptomatic. Um, and, and that's something that's very important to us too, because sometimes, um, you know, patients have an AVA of, you know, about one centimeter, but their mean gradient isn't very high. And we say, let's, let's keep watching before you need any procedure. Um, obviously, when you talk about doing a procedure, you want to wait for as long as possible because these valves, whether it's a TAVR or SAVR, don't last forever. The surgical valves, they last about 10 to 15 years is what the literature said. The TAVR valves we think are similar, but because it's a newer field, we don't know. We know at five years, they're lasting just as long as the surgical valves, but we don't know about 10 years. We know that there's some data that says they, they last, uh, 
Um, but again, the TAVR valves keep uh, improving each every few years. So you know, every time uh, we walk into the hospital in July, they almost have a new valve that's a little bit improved. So uh, again, you know, we don't exactly know how long they last, but obviously if we prolong treatment for as long as possible, that will give them the longest length for the valve. So um, it's important that we really figure out how severe the aortic stenosis is before we start fixing it. We look at her ejection fraction, a normal ejection fraction is 55% and hers is normal. Um, and then we also look at other valvular pathologies because um, if there's other valves, do we need to treat them? If there's severe uh, regurgitation of the mitral, the tricuspid valve, um, that may also make her feel symptomatic. So we have to kind of look at other valves as well. And we see for her that there was some leakiness in some in the valves, but there was mostly just moderate um, uh, leakiness in the other valves and that shouldn't make you feel so crummy. Um, so here uh, on the, the left, let's see if I can, if you can play this. So this is a, a normal heart pump. Uh, so this is a, a heart pumping. Um, you can see here that this is the main chamber, the left ventricle. This is a sonogram of the heart, an echocardiogram. Um, and uh, the left ventricle appears to be pumping well. See how it's squeezing together nicely. Um, but we see here that this valve right here, which should be opening wide, is not opening very well. And there's, it's a, it looks a little thickened. Um, so we know that that's calcium, and we can see here that the valve isn't opening well. We see the pressure gradient is high, as we discussed before, and that's classically what aortic stenosis looks like. What's our next step? As we spoke about before, the next step is our heart team approach. Um, and we get together um, either now on, now on Zoom, but you know before uh, in a room together, uh, and basically um, talk her, the patient's cardiologist, the cardiothoracic surgeon that's on the team with us, um, myself, uh, um, and uh, the imagers, and we get together and we say, what do we do for this patient? For this, it's you know a no-brainer. She's high risk for surgery. We're going to offer her a TAVR. But you know when you talk about patients that are younger, 70 years old, 65 years old, that's when the team kind of gets to be even more important. Um, but it's important that we do this for every case because sometimes we, we, miss, uh, we miss things, um, especially from maybe you know, another subspecialty um, that could be important for uh, procedure. Um, our, our next step after that is we get a CAT scan. So not everybody's amenable for TAVR. Um, you need to have peripheral vessels that are big enough. So our catheters are about, you know, um, I would say about uh, five millimeters uh, in, in diameter. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the peripheral vessels are big enough to accommodate these things. Um, and we check the, the arteries in the legs that we can go through the leg, the leg artery, you can go all the way up and then deploy a valve. Um, because if we can't go through the leg arteries, the femoral artery, then we have to figure out another way that we can get our valve across the aortic valve to deploy it. And that usually requires some sort of cut down either up here in the upper extremities, or sometimes we actually go through the neck arteries. Sometimes we can puncture through the apex of the heart, um, which, you know, all these things are essentially still a minor surgery. Um, and, you know, while you're not having to put them on cardio, uh, uh, on pump, um, on the heart lung machine, you still are, you know, invading an 83 year old female who's frail. So again, you're, you're not going to get as good outcomes. So we want to look to see if we can go through the groin arteries. And, you know, in her case, we could. Um, and then we're also looking at the uh, sizing of the valve. So we look at the annulus, which is where the aortic valve junctions with the left ventricle. Um, and we size that so that we can size a proper valve. And there's different types of valves as well. And, and this CT can give us information as to what type of valve will fit the patient best. Um, and after we've gotten our CT, we have our echo, we've had everybody weigh in, we've seen the patient, we've talked to the, 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 the referrers, we've talked to the family, we've discussed with the patients the risk of open heart surgery, of TAVR, then we need to, to generate a plan for the TAVR. And there's multiple different things that we have to think about, like what 
side should we use? Should we use her right groin or should we use her left groin? Which artery looked better? Um, and you know, one of the complications we see is a vascular complication, meaning you know, we're doing uh, an arterial puncture and we're putting a big sheath into your uh, femoral artery. So there's always a risk of bleeding or damaging that vessel, which could be uh, potentially you know, lead to things like longer lengths of stays, needing a stent or a stitch in the artery. Um, and we've seen people even die from vascular complications after TAVR. Um, so it's, it's, it's important that we really figure out what the best route is to go so that we know every step of the way before we actually puncture the patient. Then we size the valve. We decide how we're gonna sedate them. For most TAVR procedures now, we do it under conscious sedation, meaning we just give some local anesthetics around the area where we're going to puncture. Um, you shouldn't feel any of the catheters moving within the, the body, um, but you will feel it moving up and down in, in through the groin. So we numb that up, we give them some sedation. They're awake for the procedure so they can talk and they can interact, um, but they are, you know, uh, um, have a little relaxing medicine so that they're not writhing around or, or anxious. Um, and then we think about other things like uh, we need a temporary pacemaker to uh, uh, rapidly pace the heart um, so that we can uh, drop the blood pressure when we deploy the valve. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, so, you know, we have multiple things we have to figure out before we actually do any sticking. From there, you'll see here that, you know, we have our do everything in our hybrid OR, um, which is basically a suite that we use for both open heart surgeries and transcatheter therapies. So it has an uh, image intensifier, it has uh, fluoroscopy capabilities. We need the fluoroscopy, the x-ray um, to see what we're doing. And that's really what we guide most of the procedure with. We're watching under x-ray what we're doing. And you'll see here that we, on, the, on the, the left, this is us draping the patient. And we have a, a little area exposed for the femoral artery where we'll put a sheath in, a catheter. Um, and, 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 and that's how we get access to the blood vessel. And the blood vessel from the common femoral artery goes all the way up through the aorta into the aortic valve, um, where we'll take our equipment, we'll go all the way up through the valve, we'll put the, the valve across the aortic uh, valve, and then we'll deploy a new valve, crushing the old valve up against the wall, and the new valve will fit up against that uh, valve. And, and because of the radial force that it exudes, um, will stay there and does not embolize. Um, so here's just an example of you know, what you see for femoral artery access. Um, and this is the difference between an open heart surgery versus a, a, you know, a, a transcatheter therapy. It's that you give some numbing medicine uh, and then you make a small puncture with a micro needle. You get blood flow, you put a wire there and then you put a bigger sheath in um, and uh, that's how you'll have access to the, the artery. And once you're in the, the artery, then you can get to the rest of the, the body. Um, so here is under what we see under x-ray where we've injected right there. And you'll see it looks like a very healthy vessel. It has a little bit of a bend, which we'll have to go around, but shouldn't be a problem. And we know that we're in a good spot that looks healthy. You can see that the, 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 the contrast, which we're shooting, which you can see on fluoroscopy, looks like it's flowing down nicely. Then we'll take catheters and we'll put it all the way up through the aorta into the aortic valve. Um, and we're not gonna get that catheter through the aortic valve because it's so tight at this point. So what we do is we'll just take a picture with contrast. And here we see um, what it looks like. This is the, the, the sinus of the aortic valve. And here you can see the contrast is flowing into the coronary arteries and then throughout the rest of the body. Um, and we'll see here that it's not leaking back in because there's no real regurgitation. You see like a, a trace shear of it. Um, but the problem is that it, this valve, it's tough to get blood flow out. So here with this picture, we know exactly where the valve starts. So we know exactly where we need to land our valve. Now what we do is we, we take uh, some small catheters and we basically have to wire through the valve, which can be a little bit, uh, can be a little tough because the valve is so tight and the blood's shooting right up at you, but eventually we'll be successful and we'll get our catheters across. We'll put a very stiff wire into the left ventricle, which goes all the way from the groin through the aortic valve. And then we'll take our 
uh, our TAVR equipment and we'll maneuver it all the way into the aortic valve. And here you see that our, 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 our TAVR valve is fitted right where the junction is. And we're gonna deploy, we want most of it to be on the aortic side um, and just maybe about 10 to 20% on the um, uh, left ventricular side. And you'll see here, that's a nice deployment. Um, see again, the contrast right here. And then we're inflating a balloon and we inflate very slowly, we rapid pace. So essentially we're putting the patient in ventricular tachycardia through by pacing them very fast and that will drop their blood pressure so that the valve doesn't kick out. And then we deploy it, making sure that we're underneath the valve for, with, with, part, uh, with, with part of our transcatheter valve uh, and the rest is above. Um, and then you have a new valve implanted and then we'll shoot some contrast and do an echocardiogram to show that there's no leak. And you see here that after we shoot the contrast, it goes not there to the LV, but it goes out the aortic side. So we know that we placed the valve very nicely. And we also see that there's flow in the coronary arteries. Um, so we know that um, the valve uh, is seated right and is not, uh, there's a less than 0.1% chance of obstructing the coronary artery. Um, but you can see here that there's nice flow there. Um, so that would be a good valve implant, implantation. Um, and, and, and that's essentially how uh, a TAVR works. Um, we then uh, suture up the, the veins. Um, again, we, we, we use a, a suture system that's just a device. So we don't actually have to uh, physically suture it up, um, but basically put a, a device that, that sutures the hole that we made and tighten it and then hold pressure for maybe about five minutes. The patient lays flat for about two to three hours afterwards and then can get up, walk around, eat. Um, if everything goes well and they don't need a pacemaker and there's no bleeding complications, then they can go home the next day. Um, so, all right, that's great. Um, I showed you our science experiment of what we do. But now you guys want to see a little bit about why this works and is this effective. So we'll start back in the 2005-2010 era where they were doing the partner one trial. And basically what they did is they took patients that were high risk for surgery that had severe aortic stenosis. And they said, listen, you're high risk. Um, we're going to randomize you to this new therapy, TAVR, or surgery. Patients agreed, they said, okay, I'll be the guinea pig. And they randomized about a thousand something patients. Um, of those patients, about 400 of them were deemed totally inoperable, meaning surgeons said, listen, I don't care if you try to randomize this person or not, I'm not doing surgery. So, you know, he either gets a TAVR or he gets nothing. So they said, okay, you're in this arm, you're inoperable, meaning you either get a TAVR or you get nothing at all. And those patients were randomized and they went, uh, 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 half of them got TAVR, half of them got medical therapy alone. And then on the other arm, there was a high risk, uh, for the high risk where the surgeon said, yeah, I'll do it. I'm not comfortable. Listen, you, you have a higher risk of uh, something happening with the surgery, morbidity or mortality, but we'll randomize you. And then those patients were uh, randomized one-to-one to, -one to, trans, uh, to TAVR or surgery. And what they found is not surprising. What's, well, TAVR was not inferior to SAVR for, SAVR for high risk surgical patients, meaning the ones that we randomized to surgery or TAVR at one year, there was no difference in mortality. Um, and this was with the earliest TAVR devices, which um, a lot of these patients uh, were not amenable to transfemoral. They, they, they had to actually have like a puncture in their the apex of the heart or a cut down to, to, to do this. Um, but no difference uh, for TAVR versus SAVR for mortality. And then those patients where you said, we're, you're not getting anything, um, uh, they found that obviously TAVR was superior to medical management alone. Um, and patients that we didn't treat, as we knew, died. Patients with TAVR didn't die. Um, and then the devices started to get a little better. Um, they started getting smaller. The devices uh, started to improve in terms of uh, the leak around the devices, the need for pacemaker, uh, and every year they started getting a little bit better. And eventually, you know, we started thinking, well, hey, you know, yeah, it works in the high risk 
group, um, and it was approved at that point for high risk patients or inoperable patients. But how about those intermediate risk patients? We're talking about maybe, you know, the 75 year old guy with kidney issues, but is otherwise looking good and feeling okay. Or, you know, your 80 year old male who's totally healthy um, and, you know, jogs, you know, a mile and a half on the, 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 the treadmill uh, or, or whatnot. Um, so, you know, people we'd call intermediate risk. Um, and um, we said, listen, what about if we randomize them to TAVR or SAVR? Can, let's, let's, let's see what, the, what happens then. And, and what we found is that um, it was non-inferior to SAVR for intermediate risk surgical patients. And in those patients that you were able to go through the groin artery and not do some surgical cut down, it was actually superior to SAVR, meaning the mortality rates were better. Um, and that was an intermediate risk after the devices had gotten a bit better. Um, so at that point, then the discussion was, well, okay, TAVR is good for high risk, it's good for intermediate risk, um, and it's good for inoperable. Um, and there was really just one population left, which was the low risk population, meaning this, you know, obviously, you know, aortic stenosis as it increases with age, we don't see it in really 40 year old, but, you know, in a 60 year old patient, we see it sometimes in 65, we definitely see it um, in 70 years old, we, 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 we see it um, uh, a very good amount. Um, so what about those patients that are low risk for um, surgery? Could we just do a TAVR on them and, you know, get them out of the hospital in a day? Uh, and, and that was our next question. But before we, you know, delve into that issue, we have to understand that not all TAVR is alike. So, um, sorry, one second. Um, so, so uh, we have, as I said before, transfemoral, where we go through the groin. And this is the femoral artery. It leads all the way into the aorta, which leads into the aortic valve. But not everybody's a candidate for this. We can't go through here. This is how we want to do it. This is how we get the patient in the hospital. Sometimes we need to go make a little cut down to go through the um, uh, subclavian artery. Some people use the carotid artery, actually, and some people use the apex of of the heart um, to actually make a small cut down in the, the, the chest um, and go through the apex of the heart and then suture it up afterwards. Um, so again, you know, not all TAVR is the same. The benefit is that you don't have to put them on cardiopulmonary bypass, the heart lung machine. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're still exposing patients to some sort of um, uh, invasive treatment if we're not doing transfemoral, meaning through the common femoral artery. And then there's also different types of valves. You have your balloon expandable, which is what you saw an example of where we blow up a balloon. And then there's the self expandable one, which is a, a bit bigger and, um, and offers, you know, the, 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 the valve is actually a little bit higher. So it offers better hemodynamics, meaning um, the gradients um, post implantation. Um, it gives you a little bit bigger of an orifice afterwards uh, because the actual valve is up here and not right where the annulus is, um, which is a little bit more restricted. And this valve right here is self-expanding. You don't use a balloon. It just kind of goes up by itself. And as you unsheath the valve, it just expands against the annulus. Um, so these two type of valves are different. Um, and, you know, one, the self-expanding valve, this kind of pushes up a little bit more, has more radial strength, and can, it gives a, a higher rate of pacemaker, um, but it gives you a little bit bigger of an orifice because the valve is actually a little bit higher up in the design. And this one is uh, less pacemakers, but it's um, not as big of an orifice. And there's a couple other uh, um, differences in the valves as well. Um, then our big risk for TAVR is stroke. Um, and we found that it's a less risk than surgery, but it's still about a 1% risk. And any stroke in, in uh, an elderly patient is potentially devastating. Um, so the question is, is what do we do about stroke? And, and, and now we have FDA approved devices to actually protect stroke, where we put filters in the arteries that supply the brain. So before we go in, we can actually use the artery and the wrist. We could take a device that goes all the way up through the artery and the wrist and then put little filters um, to the um, uh, blood vessels supplying the brain to prevent debris from embolizing into the brain. Um, so can we do that uh, to even reduce the, 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 the risk of stroke even more? Um, and then there's, uh, well, what does the valve look like? So we know all these studies have been for tricuspid valves. And so that's the aortic valve has 
three leaflets, that's normal. But there's a subset of patients that have two leaflets, which is called bicuspid valves. And these are actually patients that oftentimes get aortic stenosis at younger ages. So when you see aortic stenosis in a 60 year old, it's generally from having a bicuspid valve, two leaflets instead of three leaflets. And the question is, is how does TAVR do in the bicuspid population? It hasn't been studied so well. We've seen that it works, but does it work as well as surgery? Um, and then there's your question about pacemakers. So again, here's a, uh, uh, just an illustration on CT. This is your sinus. This is where your valve is. This is your left ventricle. And this is where the conduction system is. So when you deploy your valve, it's pushing right up here against the conduction system of the heart. So you have, especially if you have conduction system to begin with, a good chance of needing a pacemaker. So before we do a TAVR, we ask all these questions. Where are we gonna go? Are we gonna go transfemoral? Are we gonna go elsewhere? Is there a risk that when we put this valve in, we could occlude the coronary? That could be potentially fatal. It's less than 0.1%, but if there's a chance, you know, maybe we need to really rethink it. Um, is there a risk for a pacemaker? Is there a risk for a leak around the valve? Is there a risk for stroke? How do we treat that? So we have a lot of questions that we have to ask before we do a TAVR. And at the same time, before we would do a SABR, we'd be asking a lot of questions as well. For instance, uh, are they going to need a full sternotomy, one that goes all the way from the subxiphoid, uh, subxiphoid to right where the clavicle is, um, or can they do a smaller incision? Um, sometimes they can go rightwards of the sternum and make a mini, uh, uh, what's called a right anterior thoracotomy. So just a, a, a small cut next to the, the, the sternum where they can actually see the valve through um, and, and do the whole operation through a small couple centimeter incision. Alternatively, sometimes they can actually do a mini sternotomy where they go through the sternum, but only with a, with a few centimeter incision, um, they can see the valve, they can put the patient on pump, and they can replace the valve. Um, but uh, uh, th this would obviously be a little bit harder for operators to do, but for a patient, your recovery is going to be much better if you have this than you have this. And, you know, this is one of the things that, you know, our, our we happen to have, uh, you know, in particular, uh, a couple, a couple surgeons that, that do these small incisions incredibly well. But not at every center can you do that, and 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 you really have to kind of factor it in for recovery rate. Um, plus, also, you know, a, a center that maybe doesn't do it as much, you might have more of a complication if you try to go smaller um, uh, rather than. A, a, full sternotomy. So we have to kind of factor that in, um, you know, what, and how the patient recovery is going to be. Um, and then the question of other things that we can do. I mean, so as I said, if there's other valves that need to be fixed, um, that maybe surgery might be the best option, um, unless we could also treat those valves with the transcatheter therapy. And then how about for coronary artery disease, those patients with concomitant coronary artery disease, do they need a bypass as well at the same time? Because if that's the case, then you might as well fix the valve and also do the bypass at the very same time. So we have to really kind of factor in all these questions. Um, and I think the big question is, is coronary artery disease and, and aortic stenosis. So we all know that the, the number one killer in the world is coronary artery disease. And when you look at coronary artery disease in patients with aortic stenosis, um, uh, we see that there's about a 25 to 40% incidence. Um, and the question is, is what do we do? A, a stent versus a, a bypass surgery. Bypass surgeries have been shown in the, when you have more severe coronary disease that they last longer and patients do better, but there's an upfront risk obviously because you're gonna have to do a full sternotomy. Um, so a, a stent looks much prettier, there's, it's easier recovery um, uh, and patients would rather have it. You can even you know, go through the wrist artery and patient can be up and walking around right after the procedure is done. Um, but the question is, is what's the longevity uh, and what's the best therapy for each patient? Um, and I'll, I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm, I, I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to kind of sail through this. Um, but the, you know, the, um, the, the bottom line is, is that we have to kind of figure out, incorporate the valves, all the valves that are involved, the coronaries that are involved, and figure out what's best for the patient. Surgery, where we, we can commonly do a bypass surgery with the valve, or maybe we stent the, 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 
the, um, the arteries and do a TAVR. Um, and that way we just use the groin access. Um, so it's, you know, another, another question that we're asking. Um, and then comes the, the, the big question, which is low risk. And as I said before, we know high risk, we know intermediate risk, you're probably going to get a TAVR at this point. The, the, the valves uh, and technologies are just so good at this point that, you know, it, it doesn't really make much sense to put a, someone that's a higher risk through an open heart surgery. But now with the low risk trials, we've seen that this past year, uh, a randomized trial looking at mortality, stroke, rehospitalizations, um, found that um, uh, TAVR was uh, not inferior to SAVR, and in fact, um, actually superior for several things, including the risk of stroke. Um, uh, and uh, we saw this with both types of valves, the, the self-expanding valve and the balloon expanding valve. Um, uh, one that was superior and one that's not inferior to SAVR for the primary endpoint, but less strokes in, in, in both which is a big thing. So people were getting out of the hospital sooner, costs were less and less strokes. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, TAVR became FDA approved for low risk patients as well. But we have to kind of understand that there's still questions. And as I said, we don't know how long it's gonna last in a uh, patient. So if you're 60 years old and you get a TAVR, in 10 years, whether you get a TAVR or SAVR, valve's not gonna last forever. How are we going to how are we going to fix it? Are we going to do a surgery at that point then, when you're a little bit older, or now we have the ability to put another TAVR valve in the same valve, so we just crush that valve up just like we did with your native valve? Um, so we have to figure out, you know, what's the next step uh, for the patient. Um, and there's other, you know, questions like, you know, with TAVR you can have a little bit more leak around the valve. Um, what about these bicuspid patients, as I was saying before? And what about, you know, these patients that just don't want a pacemaker? Because the pacemaker rates are a bit higher with TAVR. Um, so we have to kind of factor in all these for the low risk uh, patient. And then we come up with, you know, what we're going to do. And, you know, these things include even for the younger patients, putting in a mechanical valve, which will last forever, but you have to be on anticoagulation. And if those patients don't want to be on anticoagulation, then we have to talk about, should we do a TAVR first? You can get back to work within a couple of days. And then when you're in 10 years, when that hypothetically fails, then we do a surgical valve at that point or another TAVR in the TAVR. Um, and, then, uh, uh, um, and then 10 years afterwards, when you're 80 years old, then we put a TAVR in a TAVR or a TAVR in a SAVR. Um, uh, so it gets, the algorithm gets a little complicated and we don't have good answers yet. Um, but as you see, that's why, you know, incorporating everyone in the decision-making tree and explaining what our, what each patient's options is, is just, is so important. Um, and here we have just, you know, a little bit of what favors what, and I think this is the, 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 the summary of the slide that when you do, when you talk about leak around the valve, um, there's, less with surgical valves. And TAVR is better at this point. Now each generation gets better with reducing leak around the valve, which is um, could be significant and it may make a patient feel worse, um, but surgical valves definitely will get less. Um, and then the need for pacemaker, still less with surgical valve. But when you talk about recovery, hospital stay, strokes, post-op arrhythmia is major bleeding and the hemodynamics, meaning the actual orifice afterwards and how much blood flow you get through it, it all favors TAVR. Um, but there's still questions on the durability of TAVR. Does it last as long as a surgical valve? Probably, but we don't know for sure. And future treatments, meaning when either your surgical valve or your TAVR valve fails, what do we do next? Um, and I think that's, those are kind of the big questions. Um, and I think the important thing is, is that we incorporate the patient and, you know, it's the final decision. We can push the patient to whatever we want, but the final decision has to come from them. Um, so the summary for this is that you need to think a little bit outside the box and, um, and, and put the patient first um, and consider all options, TAVR, SAVR, cabbage and SAVR, TAVR and stents. And when coming together, you know, you, 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 you make a decision um, for what's best for the patient. You make your recommendation and then ultimately it's in their hands to decide what they want to do. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, see if there's any questions and I'm happy to just um, uh, chat for a little bit if you guys have any questions. Yeah, so if you want to stop sharing your screen, I'll open the chat up right now. Sure. Can you see the chat? Um, okay, yeah. 
All right, so I just opened the chat up. The questions usually come in pretty quick. So if you just scroll up and start from the top, you could just go from there. Okay, from all the way from the top. Well, from 11.44 a.m. Okay, 11.44 a.m. Okay, so. So just start, read them all. Okay, so starting yeah, from. Which ones you think are the best ones that you want to get to. Okay. So, okay, so we'll start with um, Samuel Billick. So if you don't place the valve correctly, is it possible to take it out without opening the chest? I mean, that, that's a very excellent question. Um, yes, it's possible. So, you know, um, I think that placing the valve is, is the key part and, and um, it's a force, it takes four seconds to place the valve. It takes, as I, as I showed you before, um, I mean, countless hours and time to understand how you're going to do it. Um, but if you don't place the valve correctly and you place it too high and it shoots out, that's dangerous. And if you place it too low, then you have a higher risk of having a pacemaker. So we try for what's called an 80-20%, you know, um, meaning 20% uh, of the valve is under the, 20% um, uh, of the transcatheter valve is under the aortic um, valve uh, annulus and 80% is above. So that reduces your risk of pacemaker, but at the same time, just say you miss a little bit or you, you, you know, it, it jerks a little bit up, you still have you know, a little bit, a couple millimeters room so that the valve doesn't um, eject into the aorta and, and go up. But what we see, you know, what we've actually had is we've seen valves embolize and generally what you do is we can just kind of grab it with a snare and pull it up into the aorta and it sits in the aorta, we just expand it out as much as we can. And the valves will keep expanding. So we'll, we'll expand it so that it sits in the aorta and it will essentially just be another valve in the aorta. Um, and it's, you know, because it's expanded, you know, instead of the valves like this, because it's expanded, it's like here. So there's a lot more blood flow. And, you know, obviously this is not something we want to do, but, you know, if it keeps them from having an open heart surgery, then we'll, we'll leave it in there. And, um, you know, they, Th those patients do fine, um, um, but it's, I mean, it's a possibility and, you know, there are, there's, there's, uh, the data now is that it's less, it's about 0.1, 0.2%, but about 0.1% of TAVRs, you need to open the, the chest. Um, and that, that, that's data as of a few years ago, um, but there are reasons that you may need to do it. So um, that's definitely a good, good question. Um, um, Okay, do you think all heart surgeries in the future can become minimally invasive with new technologies? What about heart transplants in the future of coronary bypass surgery? So, um, I mean, okay, so ex excellent, excellent question. Um, I think, uh, so for any of you guys that want to do valvular uh, um, treatments, um, I think that the important thing is that you understand how to do transcatheter technology because um, at this point, the aortic valve, pretty much for everybody, the, the answer is TAVR um, when it comes to aortic stenosis. Um, but there are still people with leaky aortic valves that surgery is the option. And we don't yet know how to um, effectively treat them with TAVR valves, those patients. Um, so we're learning about that. And we're, 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 there's new valves that are designed for that. In about 10 to 15 years, I think that probably that will be the answer for them too. Um, the mitral valve, we're already seeing a surge in transcatheter technologies, replacement, repair devices um, that, um, that still are in trials. Um, the repair devices are approved for higher risk patients. Um, um, so if you're high risk for a mitral surgery, um, then you can get a transcatheter therapy to treat that. Um, but um, I think that in the next, you know, five to 10 years, uh, we'll probably have options for transcatheter therapies for all patients with uh, mitral regurgitation and mitral pathology. Um, but I, I will say that about five to 10 years ago, they also thought that by now we would have it. Um, so we're seeing an improvement, but we're still not quite there. Um, but uh, in terms of other things like heart transplants, uh, there are ventricular assist devices that are becoming that, that we have that, that were that you can actually 
do use with uh, place with transcatheter therapies, um, but not heart transplant yet. That's not something that we we can do. I don't foresee how that will be an uh, an option. Um, short of some, you know, one of the the artificial hearts, which you know may be you know an option, and those those will see you know less become less invasive. The the the, the artificial hearts, but for a full transplant, I don't think that it's possible. But I'm sure in 30 years, I'll be wrong. Um, and the future of coronary bypass, we already see that we, you know, become more minimally invasive. Um, I'm not sure if you have Dr. Patel coming to speak for you guys, but he'll talk about how he does uh, these minimally invasive cabbages where he basically takes a, um, an artery from the, uh, um, uh, from the chest wall and um, with uh, robotic surgery, um, uh, makes an incision, does not need to put the patient um, on pump and takes this uh, big vessel from um, the under the chest wall and brings it down all the way to the main vessel of the heart. So we're already becoming less and less minimally invasive with that. But I think that, you know, stents are getting, uh, you know, our knowledge of how we treat people with stents are getting better. So cabbage will never be um, transcatheter therapy. It will always have to be um, with some sort of incision, um, but stents continue to compete with it. Um, although bypass for now is still better for those people with higher burden of coronary artery disease. Um, okay. So what's the difference in the length of procedure between open heart surgery and transcatheter therapy? Well, uh, a TAVR, so in terms of the length of the procedure, TAVR takes, uh, you know, generally by the time we get them on the table to off, it's within two hours. A surgery, um, uh, probably about four or five hours. Um, the length is not, uh, the, the, yeah, about four or five hours. Um, it's not so much the length of the procedure, but it's the recovery. So uh, an open heart surgery, I think average is about five, six days. Um, for those more healthy patients of hospital time. Um, uh, whereas a TAVR, if it goes well, you, you go home tomorrow. Um, so, so can you talk about your path to cardiothoracic surgery? Have you always wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon? Um, so, you know, the, the, the pathways are, um, uh, I did my training in internal medicine residency. So basically um, med school, four years. Then I did uh, internal medicine residency, which was three years. Um, after that, I decided to be a hospitalist, which is you know internal medicine doctor. And I did that for about a year. Um, and as I was doing that, I was kind of strengthening my resume for cardiology. Um, I then did, got accepted to cardiology uh, fellowship, and I did three years of cardiology. Um, after that, I did another year of interventional cardiology. Um, and after interventional cardiology, I did one more year of structural and congenital heart disease fellowship. And that pathway is separate from cardiothoracic surgery, where they do, you know, six years of just uh, sorry, six to seven years of just surgery um, where, so I'm actually cardiology trained um, and uh, you know, uh, it, what, so imaging, cardiology, cardiac catheterizations, like I could do that stuff, um, but I focus on uh, mostly the transcatheter valve technologies. So I'm hired by CT surgery, but I'm actually an interventional cardiologist, which is a little different than the surgeon. I wouldn't be able to do uh, an open heart surgery or a bypass. Um, that's not in my training. Um, so my pathway is one way to, to, get, to, to get to the transcatheter therapies. There are, you know, we usually have a surgeon. We have, for TAVRs, we have a surgeon in every case. Um, and there are a lot of surgeons that do um, uh, TAVR as well. Um, we, you know, right now CMS is that you have an interventional cardiologist and a surgeon in the same room, in the room at the same time. And, you know, we happen to have, uh, you know, an, an expert uh, surgeon as well. So there's three of us that do the transcatheter valve stuff. Uh, two of us are interventional cardiologists and one of us uh, is a surgeon. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the main team. Uh, so, you know, two different pathways, um, but, you know, they're all, they're all long. Um, okay, so uh, 
So how do you get the catheter through the artery without puncturing it? Um, so, so what we do is it's not, so you have to puncture the artery. So we make a small puncture through the artery. Um, and then what we do is we dilate it with sheaths and then we put in a bigger sheath through the artery. And once we have that sheath in the artery, um, and, it, and it's a, it's, it's about, it's what's called, it's about, uh, it's a, a, a 14 French uh, sheath. So it's, you know, several millimeters in, 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 in diameter. Uh, once we have that, then we can push our equipment through that sheath. So the big, you know, once you have the sheath in the artery, then you can take all your equipment and go through that sheath and you're in the blood vessel. And, you know, the, the aorta is a big vessel, but it's just making sure that the, the femoral artery is um, big enough to accommodate your, 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 um, your devices. Okay, how do you believe TAVR will suppress open heart surgeries in the near future? Um, I think that what we've seen is that you have high risk, inoperable, and you have intermediate, that it's a no brainer TAVR uh, wins um, because post op is easier. Um, because when you're 80 years old, I mean, having a valve that lasts 10 years uh, is, is really all you're kind of pushing for at that point. And then reassess when you're 90. And now with the ability to put another TAVR valve in the valve that you already have. So once that degenerates in 10 years, you can put another TAVR valve and blow it up in the, um, the valve that you have, whether it's surgery or a TAVR valve. I think that that gives patients good option. Um, but I think that the big question is the low risk population where we know that at one in two years, um, TAVR is just as good as surgery. But the question is, is what about 10 years? You know, which I think when we see the follow up at 10 years for the low risk patient, that will give us a lot more information. The problem is, is that the transcatheter field keeps evolving. So the devices keep getting better. The sheaths get smaller. The rates of pacemakers get less. So whenever we do these studies, the study from 10 years ago doesn't quite apply um, because the, 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 new, uh, the, the new technologies that we have um, will always have the argument, well, now they're even better. Um, but I think once we have, the longer the data we have to follow, um, the better, um, the, the easier it will be to justify doing a TAVR in any patient at all. Um, so someone said, do all patients with TAVR need a pacemaker? No, about, um, uh, depending on what valve you get, anywhere from about five to 15%. And obviously, you know, the older patients need pacemakers more, um, patients with more calcification around the area need it more. And we can, we're starting to predict who needs it more. Um, and there are some centers um, uh, uh, that, you know, have been able to even reduce that even more. I think that with the balloon expandable valves, our pacemaker rates less than, than 5% even. So um, yeah, definitely something that we're also improving at. Okay. Um, so uh, somebody says, is heparin given during TAVR? Uh, yeah, we anticoagulate um, all patients uh, during the procedure. Um, but afterwards, you don't need to be on anticoagulation or, or blood thinners. One of the nice things about these valves, um, we give patients an aspirin um, and sometimes even a Plavix, which is just like, a, like, like an aspirin, but a, works on a different receptor. Um, but during the procedure, we do it all under heparin. Um, and after we're done, then we just reverse the heparin with what's called protamine. Um, and uh, that helps kind of reduce the bleeding risk. Um, so are there cases where open heart surgery could actually be a better decision? If so, what are they? I think for now, younger patients with bicuspid valves, so most have three leaflets, some, some valves have two leaflets. I think for, for younger patients with bicuspid valves, um, are, it, we, we push them to surgery. Um, and that's just because we don't have good data um, uh, with TAVR. Um, but I, I certainly think that there's still patients that we need to, you know, we, we can't lose our open heart surgery skills because there are a subset of patients that just do better off. And the bicuspid patients are the, the big ones. Okay. Um, 
does the original valve need to be taken out before putting in the artificial valve? Uh, no. So again, so what's happening is this, this is the, the native valve and what we're doing is we take a, a new valve and we just expand it against the old valve. And we actually use the, the, the calcium on the, the old valve is good to help secure the new valve. Um, so we're just tacking up the old valve against the wall and then the new valve functions. It has a stent frame that pushes off the old valve and hugs against the wall. And then the new valve in that valve has its own leaflets that open and close um, uh, nicely. So I think, I think, I think that's about all the, the time I have. Um, any, anything else, Josh? I hope I covered everything you guys need. No, that was great. Thank you so much for speaking. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great. Um, just a reminder, everybody, there's a cerebrovascular webinar tonight at 4 p.m. The link is in the Facebook group. And thank you, Dr. Bassman, for coming. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's not, not hard to come these days to these things. Yeah. I can just sit at home. All right. Have a great day, everybody. All right, take care. Bye, everyone.